Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. <clears throat> I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very accomplished and senior professional and an author from Munich, Germany, Mr. Robert Gibson. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Robert is an interculturist. Inter He's an author and um, all of you know that I am very, very partial to authors. He's an author of a book titled Bridge the Culture Gaps and over 30 years experience of intercultural competence development in business and education. So Robert, before we talk about your role as an interculturalist, do tell me a little bit about your own journey in brief. Okay, I, I think my journey is a journey of crossing cultures. Um, Maybe not such dramatic ones, but ones that had an impact on my life. So um, two things. One was um, being brought up in the in London, which is a very multicultural town, of course, yeah. it has been for many years. But then um, moving to Germany back in 1985, so over 30 years ago, and experiencing the living there since then. So half my life in in UK, half my life in in Germany, and then working internationally. The other area is actually something which maybe is even more extreme than just moving between two, two European countries. Mm. And that's actually the move between being involved in education. Um, I started off as a school teacher, actually, mm -hmm. in the UK, and then I got into university teaching. And then I switched about uh, 25 years ago to working in business. And mm -hmm. I saw a big cultural difference there actually yes of course quite i had to change my mindset completely and i'm very pleased though that i've continued to be involved mm. with universities very interesting very interesting so how would you define culture yeah there are many definitions out there um and you can say things like it's um what most of the people do most of the time or it's um i like the one i like best actually is um uh, a shared system of attitudes, values, meanings, beliefs, and behavior. Mm. So, um, and this doesn't just apply to nationalities. Yeah. It applies to all sorts of different groups of people. So it's this shared system. Mm. And uh, the next question is, how do you define interculturalism? And why is it important in today's society? To me, interculturalism is about actually promoting these interactions mm -hmm. between different cultures with the aim of, uh, in the business world, of collaborating together, mm -hmm. understanding each other, working together, living together in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, it's growing in importance as globalization increases mm -hmm. and we become more interconnected uh, globally, uh, sometimes virtually, sometimes physically um i think at this time of human history uh, people are in contact with more people from different cultures than ever before so interculturalists to me are mediators in this process mm. and given the amount of work that you've done and on the subject of culture how has this helped or influenced your understanding of different cultures you mentioned in the uk and the germany uh, and then you spoke about school, university, and the corporate world. I mean, to me, that the my personal life and my work are completely intertwined. I mean, my uh, I didn't mention that actually my wife is from China, um, so we have this topic twenty four seven, and uh, I'm continually learning. And I learn every time I do a workshop with people from different different departments, different organizations. Mm different nationalities mm. so i see it as a as very very closely related so mm. it's I, I feel i'm learning all the time i think it's a lifelong thing it's not mm. not something which you like finish and say okay i've got the certificate Correct. and i can stop now and i think you can recognize that too from your, from no, no, your you're, so, you're so right because culture keeps evolving in different cultures as well yeah uh, and, and it's also changing it changes yeah. over time yeah. and um I saw a post uh, this week on LinkedIn. Somebody posted a picture of a Greek amphitheater, and they said mm -hmm. when the Greeks built towns, they, the first thing they built was a was a theater. That was a different mindset mm -hmm. in the in the history from what we would do now. We don't first of all build a theater; we build maybe a house or a mm -hmm. temple or whatever it is. Correct. Correct. Well said. Well said. 
So my next question to you, uh, Robert, is how does interculturalism relate to the concepts of multiculturalism and cross-cultural communication? What are some of the differences and some of the overlaps? Okay. Um, there are a lot of terms around which uh, are some are somehow, as you're suggesting, overlapping and sort of interchangeable. But I do see some distinctions between these terms. Mm -hmm. For me, multiculturalism is about the presence of different cultures. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not so connected. It could be in society where you have groups of people. Mm -hmm. You say it's a multi I said London is a multicultural town. Yep. You have different groups with different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And they have some interaction, but not. we're not stressing that particularly. Uh, if we talk about cross-culture, that's actually comparing uh, one or more, uh, two or more cultures. And interculturalism to me is stressing then the interactions between these cultures. Mm. There's actually another term which a lot of people are using, which actually describes something which I think is very important, mm -hmm. and that's transculturalism. So that's going beyond cultural differences and not seeing cultures so much as distinct entities mm. but you know, the commonalities mm, very interesting so let me now talk a little bit about your book uh, bridge the culture gaps and i'm going to ask all our viewers and listeners to go and check out uh, robert gibson's book bridge the culture gaps on amazon uh, i'm going to do the same so tell me a little bit about what was the motivation to write this book and what was your hypothesis? Okay. Um, actually, there are a lot of books about this now on the market. I wrote a book 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote that book, there was very few yep. books around on this topic. I could go to London to one of the big bookshops, mm -hmm. Foils in London. Every time I went there, I would buy every book on the topic and it was no problem. It would fit in my suitcase. Mm -hmm. Now, if I did that, I would need a whole library. It's yes. not possible. But it's a, it's boomed in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I felt it was time after I'd had a lot of experience, particularly in this business world, mm -hmm. uh, moving from university basically to business, I thought I had a lot of new experiences. And so I decided, okay, I would put them together. And I, I thought actually of my clients mm -hmm. who are very busy people mm -hmm. and they don't have time to read a lot of books and they don't know which books to read. So I wanted to provide them with a very compact Hmm. essence of the main ideas that I found important when I was working in business with mm -hmm. my people who were being trained by me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I actually, this was a positive effect of lockdown. Mm -hmm. I finally had some time. So I then sat down for 10 weeks and I knew I had to produce 50,000 words for the publisher. So I had to write 5,000 words a week mm -hmm. and uh, I was very disciplined and I did that and was very, they were amazed I handed in the manuscript on time because mm -hmm. it never happens. <laughs> and, uh, and that was the book. So I wanted to really pass on, on these ideas to, to people to make them accessible. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's, I call it a toolkit. It's a collection of strategies, techniques, tactics that I felt that people found useful mm -hmm. when they were, working in diverse mm -hmm. teams. The other aspect that I wanted to ask you, and I'm not sure if you, I've not had a chance to read your book, but I will. Uh, a lot of culture also used to emanate based on uh, what I call management by walking around and at the, at, the, at the coffee machine or at the water dispenser. How does your book, The Bridge, Bridge the Culture Gaps, address the challenges of virtual communication and remote work in a global environment? I think that this is obviously uh, a key topic. It's a, it was a key topic before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I was always already running and developing courses on global virtual collaboration. And the motivation there was more like cutting uh, costs of travel and uh, making the best use of people's time. And the pandemic has escalated this completely because yeah. almost everybody, uh, even my 94-year-old aunt in the UK, she had to do Zoom meetings, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, if she wanted to communicate with me because uh, she couldn't see me. Mm -hmm. So this has really escalated. And I think many of the principles are the same, actually, of working in a, a virtual uh, environment to working in a physical environment. But some things are uh, are tricky. I think it's, it's harder then to build relationships, to build trust when you don't mm -hmm. see people face to face because you're missing a lot of the signals. Mm -hmm. And also I think it's quite... Uh, it can be quite deceptive because I think it gives us mm -hmm. a false sense of proximity. Mm -hmm. So if I see you now, you look like you could be sitting next to me at my desk, but mm -hmm. actually 
you're in India and I'm in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a long way from each other. Correct. And we're using a medium which is very familiar to us because we've used it a lot. Uh, but what's going on in the background, I have no idea. And it mm -hmm. will be quite different uh, there. So I think, I think it's more really dealing with this trust building, relationship building, and overcoming this sense of this false sense of security with the uh, sense of proximity, which isn't really there. So um, I think people are sometimes underestimate this. They think, oh, it's, it's all great. And culture doesn't play a role anymore. It does mm -hmm. play a role. And it plays a role, which is something I try to cover in my book in things like how you give feedback, how you involve people, um, how you make decisions. These things remain the same and um, it, it can be difficult. So it's it, it requires more effort. You've got two factors, the virtual uh, um, factor and then the, the uh, globality or the diversity. Well said. Your book also uh, is referred to as a toolkit. Uh, can you help me understand maybe with some examples of what are some of the strategies you suggest to bridge cultural gaps? Yeah, this, this was very important for me. I, what I didn't want to write, I know you, you read a lot of books and I didn't really want to write one of these books that eight uh, key ideas about understanding cultures, mm. the, uh, the eight things about being successful people. Eight is a very important number in China. I don't know what it is in other yeah. cultures. But, mm. uh, so you have the, all the three most important. Things. So this is this definitive thing. Because I thought, actually, no, I can take things from different areas. And I call these then tools. It's a question. And I see any interaction as a situation where you need to really um, think, well, which tool do I use to solve this particular problem? Like mm -hmm. I dealt a lot with engineers. So they like the idea of toolkits, actually. Um, mm. It's a little bit oversimplified, but yeah. you have your toolkit and then you repair something mm. and you use the screwdriver for one purpose and the spanner for another and the saw for another purpose. Mm. There's one key tool which runs through the whole book, which I think is the most important one. Um, and that is the is tools connected with self-reflection, mm. because I think that the key to intercultural understanding is understanding yourself. Mm. And so I have an approach which I call the or approach. So that means observe, analyze, and reflect and recommend. Mm. This approach is something I try to encourage people to develop for themselves in the book. So the book is actually interactive. It has a lot of exercises, not just a narrative. Okay. Uh, and during this uh, work that you do on yourself in the book, you will then develop a heightened sense, hopefully, of, uh, of yourself and how mm. you react to these situations, which is as I say, a fundamental thing. And there are all sorts of other tools connected with particular mm. areas like communication and leading and um, dealing with conflict and so forth. But this is the key, I think, to this, Very which I try to encourage it with people. Very now. interesting. And what, in your opinion, is the role empathy and understanding play um, to bridge cultural gaps? I mean, to me, it's it's all about understanding, understanding other people, but also understanding yourself, what, mm. what drives me, uh, what triggers me. Why do I get a little bit annoyed sometimes with something? Um, and why do I like something? Why do I find something positive? It's all connected with the unconscious, actually, which is another element I try to bring in is these insights from neuroscience, mm. is the cultural filters that we're using the whole time. Mm. And empathy uh, is is the other very, very big key skill. That was one of the things if I asked uh, maybe managers at the end of a, of a one day or a two day mm. course or a one hour course, even what's the key skill? And those are successful people. They often said it's empathy, putting yourself, trying to put yourself in other people's shoes. The shoes won't fit because they're a different size from yours, mm. but um, they you have to try to see this perspective. So, and then I think the next step from empathy is what we call code switching is sometimes mm -hmm. that be prepared to use a technique that is not necessarily in your comfort zone so mm -hmm. something which you might think like for me i find it very hard in germany to communicate with people directly but i know that people appreciate direct communication right my british style was too indirect for many people they my boss used to say, I don't know what you want. Like, I don't understand. And uh, what are you trying to tell me? Mm. Uh, maybe you can identify with that too. I don't know. Fascinating. And, you know, that that is where I think culture plays such a big role in communication. But my next question to you, uh, Robert, is what are some of the significant misconceptions people have about working in a culturally diverse organization? 
Uh, in my experience, one of the things that I saw happen was that people put a lot of effort into like recruiting mm -hmm. uh, diverse people from diverse backgrounds. They were quite aware, particularly the HR colleagues. They and that was great. They 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 made sure that they were not discriminating against anybody in the recruitment process. And I saw often people, amazingly, diverse group of people being hired. Mm -hmm. but I think uh, the, the the misconception is to think it stops there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's then completed, tick the box, we've done diversity. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's when it starts. Uh, and it starts by making these people feel welcome, making them feel appreciated, making them feel understood. And that's the hard, that's harder, actually. Mm -hmm. And that's where you start talking about being inclusive, so making sure people are included, they're not ignored, and making them feel uh, that they belong in the organization. Because mm -hmm. only if they feel included and that they feel that they belong will they perform. Mm -hmm. Because to feel excluded is actually, for the as far as the brain is concerned, it's actually painful to be excluded. Mm -hmm. the, the brain cannot distinguish between social pain and physical pain. So being cut out of a meeting, being ignored when people are being promoted, mm -hmm. all those things are actually painful and then people will not perform right. at their best. So I would say um, the misconception is thinking it stops at diversity. That's where it starts. Mm, well said. And now given the fact that we are now in a very, very new digital age, uh, I wanted to ask you that how can technology be used to foster intercultural understanding? I mean, I think it's an enormous opportunity. I find it very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, it means that we can like have this session today without any problem. I can um, just get into my living room and uh, my office and talk to you. Um, it means that we can be connected with many more people. Potentially, mm -hmm. we can be connected with many more people who are very different from ourselves. Mm -hmm. It has massive potential. And we can also get the knowledge that was previously, when I wrote my first book, I had to go to a library and sit there and read books. And I had to get the newspapers from the archive. And, yeah. and uh, it was all very nice, but it was not very efficient. Now I can just, I, as I said, I did my uh, my book at the extreme of lockdown where I didn't wasn't able to leave the house sometimes, you know, and I didn't need to, I could just do that. So there are enormous opportunities, but there are also, of course, dangers. Mm -hmm. And the dangers is that actually, ironically, we don't meet all these people who are different from ourselves. Mm -hmm. If the uh, algorithms are pre-selecting who we talk to and we just talk to people like ourselves, mm -hmm. then we are just in our own bubble. And uh, that's very dangerous. Or we're just meeting people who are completely different from ourselves who we're going to disagree with just so that we spend more time online. Mm -hmm. So I think... Um, and the other element with like chat GPT and so forth, I'm, I'm amazed by the, the the potential of this when I've fed in things. And somebody said to me recently, I, don't, I, I just gave the topic of my talk and I sent it to them and they said, well, that's better than what you would, than I would say. And maybe my next, uh, I don't have a role as an author, maybe chat GPT can write a better book. But I think the, this is really um, important now that we develop in people these key skills to know what is the truth, what is fake, what is, and those are really key skills which um, I think are, are crucial to this uh, to this intercultural interaction. Amazing. So yeah. I have time for two more questions for you. My next is that how do you see global workplaces evolving and what role will understanding cultural gaps play in the future of work? Yeah, I, I think that um, actually we're coming to a very interesting situation where we have... In terms of communicating with people, we have a hybrid approach. We have a mixture of working virtually and working face to face. I think people are gradually they're exploring and they're finding that you can do something sensibly mm -hmm. virtually and you can do some things with impact. You might need to meet people, like you said at the beginning, with mm -hmm. the uh, a lot of knowledge is implicit and you pass on the most interesting conversations at a conference or in the coffee break. In the office there at the water cooler and the coffee yep. machine whatever mm -hmm. so those things will be happening there will be a, a, a mixture of those things so i think that's very important as far as cultures are concerned i think the debate will change i think it might not be so much about national cultures anymore it will be about because those those um, boundaries are, are blurring there's more and more people like me who uh, am i german am i british um okay i'm a mixture maybe of all those things and mm -hmm. some other 
practices do. That doesn't really help. But I think there is a big gaps evolving between perhaps some of those professional areas and some of the other areas. I, I experienced that when working with software architects. Mm -hmm. They were from all over the world. Right. And I thought, great, when I uh, when I talk to them, we're going to talk about India and Germany and all those differences. But actually, we talk more about the differences they had between their clients who were from HR than, uh, and who had a different mindset from the people in, in the software field. So mm -hmm. I think with their cultural gaps will always be there, but they are different types of gaps from what we had in the past. Well said. Great response. Thank you. And my last question to you, and this is for the thousands of people who will listen to our conversation. A lot of them are very young people. Based on your amazing understanding of culture, what would you say are three lessons you would like our viewers and listeners to take away, especially for those who are early on in their careers? Okay. I The first one would be... Um, that I think intercultural competence, it might sound like something very soft. Mm -hmm. The impact is quite hard. Yeah. And uh, it's intangible. It's mm -hmm. hard to measure. But that impact you need to take seriously. So take culture seriously, number one. Number two, don't reduce things to stereotypes, to mm -hmm. list of do's and don'ts. It's not like as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Don't be paralyzed by complexity. Yeah. You need to act and to do things. Yeah. But... Let's not reduce everything to, oh, the Indians are like this mm. and the Germans are like this. Yeah. That's going to get you anywhere. That will actually get in the way Correct. of your interaction. Correct. Third one is what I mentioned before. Basically, if you talk about diversity, and we need diversity if you want mm. innovation and you want to be close to your customers and you want to be financially successful, we know that. But take seriously that it's not just about diversity, but it's also about inclusion and mm. belonging as well. Well said. And on that note, Robert, and your three wonderful lessons, you know, about uh, the, the impact of uh, intercultural competence can be hard. Uh, take culture seriously, you said. Second, which is so, so important and so powerful, which you said, don't reduce everything to a stereotype. And the third one you said was, I spoke about diversity and inclusion, and you said inclusion is very important. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to me about culture, about your book, Bridge the Culture Gaps, and about so many different aspects of interculturalism. Thank you again and good luck. Thank you very much for having me. It was great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.